Blah, 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 blah. Welcome to the Our Forever Smiles podcast, a podcast created to support mothers of children who were born with clefts and those who love them. I'm your host, Laura Arroyo, and I'm also a mother of a daughter who was born with a surprise cleft palate. I know the challenges you face every day, whether you have just learned the difficult news of your baby's cleft lip or palate, you're in the midst of pre-op or post-op, or you're an OG cleft mom. This podcast is for you. In a weekly conversation, we will talk about everything from feeding and speech therapy to surgery and school. We'll share tips from guest experts and advocates and even share a little joy in the process. You can listen to Our Forever Smiles wherever you listen to podcasts. Don't forget to subscribe and stay tuned. Hello, and welcome back to the Our Forever Smiles Clef Mom Diaries and Support Podcast. I am Laura Arroyo. Before we jump into this episode, I would like to invite you to join this community to hear conversations with other Clef Moms and advocates that will help you feel supported along your journey. All I want you to do is click the follow or a subscribe button. I love your support. It's incredible to see all of us come together. And we're just getting started. I can't wait to go on this journey with you. Thank you so much for subscribing. We have so much in store this year. As a note, we're not medical doctors, and we do not intend for you to use this information that we share here as medical advice. We are parents and advocates who love our children, and we are sharing our own personal experiences. I also want to add uh, that we are not scientists. Uh, There's... So much misleading information out there and and about clefts, and I just don't have all the answers. But one thing I really want to be sure to mention is that nobody has all of the answers. Yeah, I'm going to add that scientist portion to our disclaimer every week. (laughs) This week has been a whirlwind for me. I've just been trying to like plan and just be organized with everything that's coming up and While I've been like running around just scheduling appointments with all these specialists for my daughter Giselle for the past year and a half, I forgot that I too need to take care of myself and see a specialist. I live in the United States. I live in North Carolina and I've uh, been looking online for an OBGYN to get a regular just wellness appointment. And I found out that um, UNC, which is our major hospital network in North Carolina, has parted ways with Cigna. And so I didn't really, I didn't really know that. I didn't really take the news like that hard for myself, but my daughter's cleft team is at UNC. And so I'm really sad and just like shocked that I'm going to have to find another option for her. That's truly a bummer to say the least, but we'll survive just like we've survived all of these things that we have gone through. But yeah, that's the latest discovery for me. I'm really excited today. We have a guest. She is really like a documentarian of sorts as I've just looked through her content and just have gotten to know her over these past few days. So she's really been able to really document her journey very well. I'm really bad at social media and so I admire like people that are able to use it as a vehicle for expression, just a tool to build awareness and of course just like a place to have beautiful memories to reflect. So Today, we have Jennifer Jeffries Vincelet. Jennifer is 38 years old. Uh, She's a wife. She's been married to her husband, Cody, for five years. And she's a mother of two beautiful girls. Uh, I love girls. I'm sorry. I'm biased. I really wanted a girl when I got pregnant. And I was like so excited that I got a girl. So I'm very girl power over here. Amelia is three years old and Anastasia is 20 months old. Welcome, Jennifer. Hi, Laura. Thank you so much for having me today on this podcast. (laughs) So Jennifer has a really interesting story because she actually relocated her family to Philadelphia for eight months in 2022 to give birth at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. That choice is to just be in the care of one of the top class lived in 
palette teams there, which I thought that I just find that so like fascinating. And I don't know, I hate, I have, for some reason, I don't like using the word brave, but it's just like a bold move. I feel like to do something like that or to be able to like have the guts to do that. But when it comes to our children, we do everything that we can to, to help them, right. To make the best decisions for them. But before we jump into the move, Talk to me about when you found out you were pregnant. Were you expecting it or was it something that just happened? We had Amelia and she was a little over nine months, I think. And we had definitely wanted to add to the family and we just didn't know when. Or So it wasn't completely planned, but we knew that we wanted to add. And so it was a little bit of a surprise, but we were excited and super just excited to add to the family. And we were, we did the genetic, te- did genetic testing a little bit early on and found out it was a girl and that Amelia would have a sister. And yes, I was stoked about that coming from a sister <laughs> family as well. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, yeah, yeah. 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 That's what I would tell people too. I'm like, I wasn't necessarily trying to get pregnant, but I also wasn't doing anything to not get pregnant. So it's yeah. one of those things I was like welcome, welcoming it to myself and very excited about that. So what were your pregnancy symptoms? Um, So, so I was still breastfeeding Amelia. She was really young. They're about 17 months apart. And I didn't have really much of the uh, sickness, I would say, like morning sickness, but I was so exhausted running after this mm. baby that was on the verge of becoming a toddler. I think the exhaustion was just on a whole nother level at that point. And I just, just you're like trying to like lay on the couch and get rest. And it's like basically a kid opening up your eyelids. Hello, I'm here. <laughs> oh, you know, yeah. So, but I really can't complain. Just the normal, yeah, but not really morning sickness I would say just the bloating and the but I was on my feet constantly and I didn't have that chance like the luxury of the first pregnancy to just go lay down oh yeah yeah I miss those naps oh god they'd never come back like just nope. the, those the pregnancy naps that you could just take like with your first child yeah those oh, are, I took goodness. them for granted my aunt usually my aunt literally told me she's go when you're pregnant you're annoyed with everyone's comments but it's just she's go ahead and take all the naps that you can now honey because you're not gonna have another one for a long time and she's she meant well she was telling the truth but yeah yeah <laughs> I know I feel like we're gonna be in that position one day totally <laughs> giving that advice right oh uh, yes. <laughs> And trying not to at the same time. We're like, oh, but I can't help myself. <laughs> yeah, it's so funny that people are. It's, I always think to myself, like, why didn't anyone tell me this? And I'm like, actually, everyone told me this. <laughs> just all the yeah, things yeah. that motherhood is can be challenging. And and just all the things, right? It's You've never been able to relate more to something. I look at all the memes and stuff online and I'm like, wow, I, really, I get it now. I thought I got it before, but I really get it now. Um <laughs> Um, one thing that I wanted to say, just to clarify, Jennifer's Jennifer has two daughters. Amelia is her baby that is non-class affected, and Anastasia is her class affected baby. And this was was your second pregnancy, and and I guess having them so close together because really, Amelia was. I'm pretty sure in your eyes, my daughter is 16 months now, so she's still a baby to me. <laughs> it was like, you're still, you still have a baby at home, right? Like you, you had them back to back. It's so funny. My my daughter is on my screensaver and, and we took that picture of her that's on my screensaver when she was about like 11 months. And she, literally the other day, she looks at the picture and she goes, baby. And I'm mm. like, you are the baby. <laughs> yeah. I know it's bizarre. They, yeah, they're definitely doing the same thing, and it's just crazy to me. I'm like, oh no, you had to be. Yeah, oh, but uh, yeah, I just wanted to make that clarification that Anastasia is your cleft affected baby, and I guess experiencing having a like a quote unquote normal pregnancy, normal birth. Um, what I guess in finding out that your daughter was going to be cleft affected. Uh, first of all, when did you find out? And I guess talk me through what your emotions were through that process of just the day that you found out. 
sure I knew this was coming. So I was having the butterflies and a little bit of apprehension today to relive those moments. And we live in Jacksonville, Florida. That's actually the girl's name. Um, my my daughter Amelia is named after my great grandma, but there's Amelia Island here. And then Anastasia came naturally because there's Anastasia Island. So my little island girls. And so we're in Jacksonville, Florida, and that's my husband is military, a former military now. He was in the Navy. And it was around the end of October that Amelia turned one and my entire family had traveled in because we just got over a year of COVID and we were able to have somewhat of a, a, a celebration. It was still minimal, but my in-laws came from California. My family came from Georgia and New Jersey and my sisters were there and it was a great celebration and I just felt so blessed and I still am, but it was just a moment of really just being thankful for what was around me. And then my husband went away under, he had to go away for two weeks for the military. And so I was by myself with Amelia and a little overwhelmed and just trying to hold down the fort. And so he finally got back and it was Veterans Day and I didn't realize that the daycare was closed. And so we ended up bringing Amelia to the doctors with us. So it was the four, the three of us going to look at anesthesia. And I was like, okay, this is going to be a special moment. And there still had some restrictions for COVID. Like my husband was allowed to be in the room with me for the ultrasound, but he wasn't allowed to be in the next room when we go and meet with the doctor to review the ultrasound. It was very strange. I don't know how all that works. That but so <laughs> sorry. Yeah, it is. It was so it was so stupid. Yeah. So we went into the room and we saw the ultrasound and I didn't have any any feelings that anything was wrong. The ultrasound tech had been the same one for Amelia and we mm. we just connected with her. And so we were just going through and just giggling and looking at her and she was confirming she was a girl and all the things. And then I said goodbye to my husband. He had to go to work and he knew that he couldn't be in the next room. And here I am tackling like the baby. And then the nurse, I'm sorry, the midwife came in and she just had the sheet like, I don't know, this just look on her face and her face was sheet white. And I just I was like, oh, no, there's something wrong. And she like stuttered on her words. And I would never want to be in their shoes. It's horrible to be able to deliver things like this. And I'm sure it was her first time. And I don't even really remember what she said. But I just mm. knew that she said that there was a cleft lip and palate. And I had no idea what that was. No clue. Mm -hmm. And she's just not really even explaining it because I just started bursting out in tears and because I didn't know and and she's asking me if I have any questions and I'm like of course not and no I'm like my husband should be here like why why isn't he allowed in this room I was getting angry and like hostile about that because I just felt like I wanted to turn and hug him and and be okay with everything and he wasn't there and so we called yeah. him on speakerphone and taught and I just said the baby's alive she's okay but there is something that the midwife needs to share with you and and I'm just hysterical crying and I couldn't even hear it yeah we found out in that ultrasound and it was I know that a lot of people don't get that privilege but I am thankful that we did but it, it was shocking and just I just felt paralyzed yeah Every single time I have these conversations, right, and I'm able to listen to so many different stories and it never, to me, like I, just you telling me I have like goosebumps, like it never, I don't know, it gets easier listening to people's stories about just finding out and just like hearing that like raw emotion of you feel worried, you feel frustrated, you angry, concerned, scared. It's, it's just so many things like I. I'm every single back. emotion <laughs> if every single I'm emotion floods you're bringing in you're just helpless because you yeah. want to search it right away you want to find out why you want to find out answers and for anybody i'm a little bit of a overachiever type a have control and at the moment you don't have any control you have no control mm. and you have to give it up to a higher power god mm. the universe and really trust but yeah, it's a flood of emotions that were just, oh, can't even count them. <laughs> yeah. Was your daughter Amelia still with you or did your husband take her 
Oh, the daycare was closed, you said. Yeah. Yeah. So she was still still there in that moment. And I just, I immediately called him. I said, you have to meet me. And I was crying Mm -hmm. so uncontrollably, like sobbing. He was like, you can't drive. And so he just met me and I just got out of the the car and I just melted in his arms. I just was just so thankful that I was able to see him in person and just cried. I didn't know what else to do. (laughs) Yeah. What was his reaction to that? I guess I don't, I'm not sure if you, in the moment, sometimes they're just strong for you in the moment. Have you all talked about what his feelings were like after he found out as well? Yeah, we eventually, we did talk a little bit. And you know what? I guess it really wasn't a good I think that's really good. I think that is something we need to revisit face to face. But to listen to him tell somebody else the story. Yeah. It's just, it it was admirable for him to talk about his emotions too. And he was scared. He was just, he knew it was going to be okay. And that he is a a glass half full, super positive. Everything's going to work out. But mm-hmm. to not recognize the he recognized that it was a scary time. Yeah. Okay. And did you find out at your was that your twenty week anatomy scan? Yes, it was the anatomy scan. Yeah. And it was a bilateral cleft lip. And at that time we would assume a palate and which Leads to a whole other onset of questions because they need to confirm whether the palate, if the is the brain affected, is the this affected, is and the ear like all these things. It's just like a chain reaction of things that could also be affected from that. Oh, uh, and they were actually clear on that part, meaning that we would need to get more testing done to talk about or confirm anything else. Yeah. And so you mentioned also like when you were given this information that you didn't necessarily know what really like the details of what they were talking to you about. What is it even, right? Yeah. Am I going, what am I dealing with here? I guess. So what did you do after that? I guess. What did you do in terms of research or looking or um, to prepare for birth or just to educate yourself a little bit? Sure. No, this is, I think is so important. I, I grew up in New Jersey and I grew up with the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia being a household name that was just close by within an hour. My sister had gone there for something when we were younger. Everybody had some kind of connection to that hospital. And my very best friend that I grew up with in New Jersey, her daughter is now six years old and she At the time she was two years old, they found out that she had a tumor on her kidney. And the Mm. tumor was the size of a plastic water bottle, huge. And she had gone through the removal of that big tumor out of her body and with a minimal scar. And then Mm. she had to go through chemo and and all the things. And, And so immediately I called my best friend. She has a medical background. And she is very well versed in researching hospitals. And so is her husband. Mm. They both have careers in medicine. And it was easy to open up to her and explain what was going on. And I couldn't have asked for a better friend to talk to Mm. because she just calmed me down and told me exactly what I may need to hear. And it wasn't the, yeah, everything's going to be right. But she made me take action and Mm. or gave me what I could do to be productive. And really it was she and she helped with this too, was researching the top programs because I wasn't going to become an expert on Googling everything, although that was exactly what I was doing. And I knew that I would have to build a relationship with a program and a team and I needed to trust them. I didn't need to be in a position where I needed to question every single thing, but you are going to have to do that. But just knowing their reputation and understanding, hey, these people know what they're doing. And so we just gathered like the top programs and it didn't necessarily mean at the time that I wanted to relocate there or live there. or It was just like, what are these people doing different? And, and learning from their programs and what they had that is so special. And children's hospital, Philadelphia came up 
numerous times. And then there was a couple other programs and even one that was close by us in Florida, but it just, that got my focus. And so I just yeah. called, just called them for a consultation and they set the standard. They set the standard for the questions for me to ask the things that they would have lined up for me for the, for the day, if I was going to do an orientation and how their program was. And so then I knew mm -hmm. if I wasn't going to relocate there, what kind of standard to have with other programs around me and what kind of questions to ask. If that yeah. All makes sense. <laughs> yeah. That is really, that's so interesting because I never thought about this, about that this way, but there was something about after finding out having, you mentioned that your friend may take action and that, um, I think the having something to do or to organize something is like really fitting for my personality type. And it was, it's gonna, maybe it sounds weird, but it, it was the thing that kind of calmed me a little bit, like me having to figure this thing out and to do like this research and to build in like these, what's next for her and what's the progression of this thing or her treatment plan and figuring out where we were going to go or who was going to see her was something that was really, it, it just gave me, I, maybe it was just keeping me busy so that I didn't think about the actual, like her actual diagnosis. I was just more focused on how we were going to treat it and how we were going to take this thing, this thing head on. And you did mention that there were other programs. Do you remember what those other programs were that you didn't uh, ultimately go to? Yeah, there there was a program in Orlando, there was a program in Baltimore, and there's a program in Boston. And those were some of the top that I, we were looking at. And to go back to what you were just saying, Laura, I think it's, it's important to obviously deal with your feelings and recognize that there's something going on and we don't need to cover it up. I think I, think I did dive right into just go plan. And there was a point where I just, you know, I found myself just sobbing and that was okay. Like it was okay to have a little bit of the grieving and really recognize like this was going to be a hard journey for you and your child because the doers and the planners and the A's, type A's, like we just, we do, we try to just don't yeah. cover it. And so it was important to recognize it and deal with the feelings a little bit, but not to the point where it paralyzed me into a depression and I couldn't move. So it was a good combination taking that action and and knowing what that purpose was because we now know the purpose and what we're trying to be in, who we're trying to be an advocate for. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Ah, your story is so good. It, it's so good because there's so many things that you've experienced and that it, they come up. So I don't want to go on tangents. As no, you talk, yeah. <laughs> as you talk, I think it makes me think of other things. Yeah. And when your preparation, just as, as I was saying earlier, because you had Amelia and you breastfed her and I guess grieving that, knowing I'm pretty sure that many specialists told you that you weren't going to be able to breastfeed. What was it? Did you have, did you grieve that at all? What were your thoughts and how did, how were you able to move past that? Absolutely. I mean, I just felt, okay, I guess a resonating feeling that comes up for everyone during this process is guilt. Mm -hmm. I felt guilty that I wasn't mom guilt, right? We hear it all the time, and but just, there's so many aspects of this journey that it popped up. And yeah, I wanted to give the same that I gave to my other daughter. And obviously every baby is different and every journey is different. I had a hard time with that. And because it wasn't easy breastfeeding, it was something that you give mm -hmm. up, you know, give yourself to your child. And it was something I wanted to do. And it's not for everybody. Uh, and I just felt this fear that I wouldn't bond with my baby the same way. And, and you know, I just felt it, it was just, yeah, a fear because you're just thinking of all these scenarios and all you're doing is thinking. But yeah, it was hard to adjust, but the outcome of it, there's so many ways you can bond with your child. And actually, I was pumping exclusively um, and trying to provide the milk, having a 17-month-old jumping all over me and 
<laughs> timing the bottles like where, you know, I could get the milk out in time for this screaming baby who's so hungry and, and all those things and or warming it up. So that's just the right temperature and making sure I'm on the schedule. And then I just was running myself ragged. And, and so after four months, I think the biggest blessing I did give to my bonding with my child was letting go of it for her and moving over to formula. That was just my journey. But yeah. And then yeah. I did, I think that I absolutely bonded even better because I was enjoying feeding my baby mm-hmm. instead of stressing to get every ounce and in with her and like just, and almost yeah. to the point of resenting it because I was just, me just stressed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. It was and hard. Also, there are so many mothers that worried about building that bond. And if you, I always say breastfeeding, whether that be nursing or just, Whether you're at the pump, it is a labor of love. It it really is. And if you're able to do it, well, kudos to you. But if you're not, all kudos to you as well. And I think that, um, so I was never able to breastfeed. I did. I pumped. I pumped. I probably pumped for four or five months. But we were supplementing as well. So early on, we we were. It was strictly breast milk, and then eventually, as I I wasn't keeping up with the pumping, but our bond was just growing because we were spending so much time together. It was just so much, so many appointments, you know, and so day to day, I I kept her at home for the first year just because I was just so worried about the feeding before her surgery, and I wanted to make sure that she was getting what she needed. So I did keep her at home, and so we have the best bond I've, I've I was just been able to spend so much time with her and we spent a lot of times where it was just us two because my partner had to my fiance had to go back to work and so it wasn't there was no shortage of, of bonding there we were <laughs> running the town together and, and it was it was really stressful to have to go through all those appointments and then have to just pump as well yeah pump I remember <laughs> Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> the very first appointment that I went to, I was literally first of all, I was late, and so the specialist told me, "Okay, I can't see you now, but if you want to wait until the afternoon, I, I can see you in the afternoon." And so I told, I just waited because the hospital was about an hour and a half away, and so I was like, "If I go back home, that's going to be an hour and a half, and then I come back, it's just going to be crazy driving, so I'm just going to stay." But I was, that was like my first appointment at that, at the big facility where I was going to meet her club team. And I was, no, I was actually going to go see the feeding therapist. I was leaking everywhere, literally. (laughs) It was just so awful. And by the time, yeah, oh my goodness. By the time she saw me, she's horrible. Why didn't you tell me that you were just waiting around? I didn't know. I would have squeezed you in somewhere. I wouldn't have just made you wait that long. And I said, I, I didn't want to. I was during that time, I was delirious. But <laughs> but in that same conversation, what in the same theme, what was your your hardest appointment? Oh, my gosh. OK, so I I didn't take into consideration postpartum period when we did this relocation. And this relocation was, we sold our house in Jacksonville. My husband got a temporary transfer with the company he was with. It all lined up. It was okay. Mm -hmm. And we were able to get into a condo up in in Philadelphia. It was a three-story condo, which I know people live this on a daily basis. And I give you so much credit, okay? But my daughter would not let me put her down on the stairs. So I'm like picture car seat in one hand, you know, 17 month old in the other hand, walking up and down the stairs, postpartum like a day. I'm just like, oh. and um, same coordinating, getting them into the car and out the door mm. every week because we had the NAM and we had the program where it was adjusted every week. And I honestly, off the top of my head, a single one does not stick out. Just those darn stairs that go like <laughs> three flights. And if he forgot something, I wasn't going to leave the baby in the car by oh, themselves. So I'm like, I got to go back upstairs. And I'm just like, yeah, that that was I just people coordinate that every day. I just was not used to it. And with the two babies and whatever. And then getting to the doctors. And if it really was so good, she had some moments. And, and so if I couldn't get to 
her and then Anastasia. It's just, it was a lot to juggle both and I didn't have any help. But yeah, I was afraid to have somebody come into the home with like Philadelphia was very strict with Mm -hmm. COVID at that point still. And so I was afraid to have people come into the home and going back and forth to the hospital. I didn't want them to get exposed, any sicknesses. It was just a whole nother level. But yeah, I didn't take into consideration postpartum and trying to get around and Mm -hmm. just all that. Wait, and trying to, so the prompt thing, I'm like sitting there in, in the waiting room pumping with both of them. It was just, I can't believe what we do. I just, mm-hmm. I'm laughing when you yes. back at it because it's just a blur of so many of those combinations that we just don't even think about. You just do. You put your head down and yeah. do Yeah. <laughs> You're just like on autopilot. Like I, I yeah. think back as well and I'm just like, oh my God, like how did I even, like how was I? how was I even alive like I was <laughs> and I was literally like running on zero, zero sleep and it was just like and then yeah I was so worried because I'm like trying to drink caffeine to stay up but then also I'm like worried about the caffeine too much caffeine in the milk just all these things and so yeah so did you move to Philadelphia after Amelia was born or did you give birth to her there Anastasia. Oh, so Anastasia. Yes, it's okay. Sorry. It's okay. We're going to do this. So <laughs> <laughs> it's confusing. I know. Anastasia. So we went up to Philadelphia in January. My daughter, Anastasia, was born on March 25th. And in January, we interviewed the program. And I was like, Cody, this is where we are. we're going to be. We just loved it. And what I didn't realize, I went through the whole day and everybody was like oh every part of the program we kept asking oh are you going to give birth here and I was like yeah I'm going to give birth at the children's hospital and not thinking that it was like you had to go through this approval process I was just like yeah what am I going to do drive my daughter from Florida up here I'm not flying on a plane like them being a week old and like all this logistics wise I was like yeah, yeah. give birth here mm-hmm. and so at the end when I met with the <laughs> the actual doctor who's in charge of the maternity floor, I was, she was like, okay, so what's your plan for giving birth? And I was like, I'm going to give birth here. And she's actually, I'm the one that approves that. And I was like, oh, I said, I'm so sorry. I didn't know this was an approval process. For cleft lip and palate babies, it's not an emergency when they're born. And, and contrary to belief, it is very important for early intervention. Mm -hmm. And so at this point at Children's Hospital, they, their cleft lip and palate team was getting bigger and they were noticing the bigger um, improvement in children and thriving earlier on with the earlier Mm. intervention. And so they said, we don't normally do this because we reserve their maternity floor for those who have emergencies when the baby comes out. But we know that early intervention is extremely important in cleft lip and ballot. And we would like to invite you to give birth here. And I just felt so honored. And oh, my gosh. Wow. Okay. I didn't realize it was this big process and big deal. And I was like, oh, my God. Thank you so much. I don't want to take away from anybody who has it needs it more than I do, whatever. But I embraced it. And yes, I gave, we moved up a month before the birth. And, and we wow. gave birth at the hospital. And we had that early intervention and even though it was at a hospital that specializes and has an amazing cleft lip and palate team the nurses that were involved which are all saints they're all amazing they still don't have all the training that Mm -hmm. they need and so it was a lot of back and forth between the different doctors explaining how to use the different bottles and showing the nurses how to use, yeah, just the pigeon bottle and the Dr. Brown bottle and finding which one would work for Anastasia. And that's where it's super crucial in that intervention because we need the babies to thrive right away. And what happens most of the time is that they're coming back two to three weeks after birth because they're not gaining weight and not knowing how to eat. And that's when it becomes the emergency instead of right out of birthing. (laughs) Yeah, I would agree um, with that 100%. So um, my daughter, Giselle, she um, she actually ended up 
have it being admitted to the NICU after she was born, not immediately after, but a, a couple of days after she was born, because the nurses just didn't know what to do. They had no idea. Like they, they were literally like clueless. And so they, we, and the, the feeding therapist only came to see me. They came to see me two times and it was just, it, she, it was just a, a mess. And I don't to, I don't want to place blame on anyone or anything like that. But I also feel like with COVID, things like changed a lot. There's a there were a lot of nurses that were like contract nurses and so they weren't like that wasn't like necessarily their home hospital. And so there was just a lot of people that were pretty transient. And yeah, it was just that was really tough. And so sometimes it makes me wonder I know Clef lip and palate aren't necessarily like common things but it just made it feel like it was so rare like even with the conversations that I've had with other moms on the podcast it's they said that their hospital hasn't seen a cleft lip or palate in 20 years or something like that of course I don't fault anyone for just like having that information I didn't have any information about this I didn't know that this was going to happen to our family either and so I have a little bit of grace in that, but certainly it just seems, I don't know, it just, I, I I don't even know how, I guess the first steps in providing like nurses some information or resources or things to just be a better support to mothers. Yeah. It's just, yeah. And that, I, I think I, I may have mentioned with you personally, that's part of when I get out of this fog of this journey, I do want to implement some kind of training for nurses on it, even if it's just bottle training, because knowing I just remember talking it over with every nurse and I was pumping. So because I was I wanted to make sure there was enough food provided and I want to make sure they didn't throw out my milk. And it was just around the clock. I And moms, you you have to take care of yourself because this second day in the nursing yes. NICU, I almost passed out on the floor because I forgot to eat. I like literally went from the delivery room into the NICU and just didn't leave and, and barely went home and ate. And mm. it was just that everybody's in that fight or flight mode when they when their child is there. But I, yeah, there's specifics to the bottles and making sure that it, it gains traction on the baby's mouth and making sure that they, the milk is actually going into the, the body. And yeah, I know it's hard. And it does make you think, even in that specific hospital where it's so common, but and they have a, a whole program dedicated to it, but nobody gives birth at the hospital there that has a cleft lip and palate. So the nurse in that section had no clue. And they, and I was like, somebody needs to talk to everybody. Like, is there, yeah. you guys have your team meetings every morning? I see everybody out there. Are we reviewing? And I was just starting to become like, I, I requested to talk to everybody. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because they were threatening with, I'm sorry, this is the reason. Not threatening, but they were saying if she doesn't gain the weight, she's going on a feeding tube. And I said, there's no way. I said, I know that is the option and the worst, but we're missing the boat here. There's too many people involved. She got the intervention she needed and we're not failing at this. So many people would die to be in this position and have all your help here. And I have it and we're not going on a feeding tube <laughs> so. literally the same thing happened to me literally <laughs> they told me next day if she doesn't get it was like 55 milliliters per feeding she's going on a feeding tube and that was like i was i was no i was literally like no she's not and we're gonna do everything that we can so that won't happen because i feel like that's I don't want to say it's like the easy out, but I, I guess it's just like the solution when someone is frustrated by yeah. the situation. And um, and it's just like you said, it is the, the lack of um, nurse training and just just not knowing. One of the greatest questions that my fiance asked, because you, I went home without my daughter, and so there was a lot of times where I would go home and come back. And so, of course, there would be like a new nurse there. And he asked, he said, so what is your process for like knowledge transfer? Like, how do you ensure that what we did in the morning, he, the person, the next nurse that comes in knows exactly what, you know, is going on with her? 
And That's of course, awesome. they, they assured us that what's in the chart and stuff like that. And we were like, well, we don't trust that because... That's yeah. what they said the day before. And then the, the person came in and did the opposite of what we said. So it's just, just staying on top of it is like really important. And just asking those, just the right questions to just figure out what is the right intervention for your child. And so what was your initial reaction after seeing her born, seeing her face for the first time. Um, I was so excited. <laughs> like, I just, oh my gosh, I tear up. I just was so excited to meet her. I was exhausted. And that birth was, she was huge. And I just, or I just felt like that at the time. And, yeah. And I just felt like it was so hard to push through that birth because I was so tired from Mm. everything and i was like okay hello this is what we've <laughs> been waiting for i can't give up now so like one of those stereotypical like movies where i'm like i'm tired i'm not doing any more pushing you know it's so dramatic like i'm not going any further and they're like you want it's... you gotta meet her and i'm like okay i'll give one more push and i was just like so over it but um i was so I excited like to every hold woman her. is felt that way <laughs> I don't know, like with Amelia, like my first child, it was like, I don't know, it was just different. So everything was different. But uh, yeah, I was exhausted. And so I was excited to meet her. But I was also, I knew that they were going to take her away right away. And so I was like, take a picture. I'm like, let me hug her. We, I want to do skin to skin first. And, and they're like, we have to take her, honey. We have to, and I'm like, I'm coming. I'm getting off the table. They're like, no, you're not. Like, like, no, you're like, not. <laughs> So obviously, it was relief to, I just saw her face and I knew it wasn't the normal. It was hard. Mm -hmm. She was, she has a, a, a bilateral lip and nothing can prepare you for, but I just, the love, obviously, it doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> she chose me and, and I'm her voice mm -hmm. and her biggest advocate and I wasn't going to let her down for anything. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Mm. And so the, was the decision to move her to the, was she in the NICU immediately after or they just wanted to take her just to evaluate her a little bit further? They did put, I think it was protocol to put her in the NICU right away. And mm. she was a healthy baby. Most of our cleft babies come out healthy and strong and we just need to make sure that they're maintaining and gaining that weight. And so after 24 hours, she was able to go into the PICU, which is a little mm, bit less hands-on. Yeah. And so that was really good. And that was a good transition. And and that's where we were just trying to gain as much weight. And then we weren't, but then we got it all squared away. So Yeah. And so has Anastasia had both of her surgeries? Like has she had her lip repair and her palate repair? So really unique thing about Anastasia is that she was able to have both surgeries at the same time. Heard that. Yeah. So oh. her palate didn't go all the way back. It went to a point in the roof of her mouth where it was, I guess she was able to have both at the same time. And so we did the NAM mm -hmm. for six months. Oh my gosh. That program was amazing, but also like by the time they're six months, because most of the time the lip repair is done first and it's done around three or four months. And you, when you have a NAM and they're that little, they're not like ripping it out of their mouth. And it's really good because it's counteractive, like it's pulling everything together and stretching things so that there's less pulling of these parts and pieces to put them together in their mouth and then less revision later. The NAM is a great program. And so we did our weekly adjustments and things and we were doing that for from March till September. And by the end, she was ripping that thing out every other minute. We were screaming and fighting me to put it in. I was like, I can't do this anymore. As you guys know already, I'm like prior and I'm like I just having all the emotions and I'm like, you know what? I'm just if it didn't go in it didn't go in at that point i know it did most of yeah. the work and i was just afraid of ruining it it's like your braces right if you didn't mm -hmm. put your retainer in 
you were like your teeth shift overnight and I was just like is it like that and the nurse is like it's gonna be okay she's gonna be fine I wasn't following the directions and I had no control over it it was just but yeah so she had one surgery in September of 2022 and it was the lip and palate repair and yeah (laughs) oh wow okay big deal so does yeah so her palate was it just her hard palate that was affected is that why or did it go into her soft palate it went it was this it was the hard palate so it went like halfway on the top of her mouth it's in between yeah 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 Mm mm-hmm Wow. Okay. Yeah. Go in a station. Okay. <laughs> I just, the easier, right? The better. I feel like I always, yeah, that's a, a thing for me. And so the NAM process, I feel like, I don't know why. I feel like that's a little bit, I don't know, like controversial. <laughs> I don't know if controversial is the word, but I guess some families do it and some families don't want to do it. I guess it's, uh, I think, Obviously, the way that you've described it, it's not the easiest thing. But I think if it were me, I would try the best that I can. I I would try to follow the program as closely. And then if I didn't get it right every time, but I would try to. But you would recommend the NAM, right? Like you would say that that it was worth it, you feel like? 110%. That was a big part of our move because they said they could mail it to us every week make the adjustments if we wanted to really do it that way I really wanted the hands-on and know that I was doing it right and it was Mm -hmm. a gradual process like first it was taping because in a bilateral cleft lip and lip the middle piece is what they need to stretch the most the lip underneath your nose is what needs to be stretched the most in order for the surgery to have less revision and I'm not talking again medically correct here (laughs) Um, or yeah. medical term. So I'm just trying to describe it so for a visual for everyone. But so uh, there's tape on the lip and we're trying to pull the, the lip down and stretch it. And so it's a series of little rubber bands and tape. And then the actual NAM piece comes in later and it's like a retainer in the mouth. Mm-hmm. Um, and each week, the team, it's truly a team because the orthodontist is the big part of the NAM adjustment. And mm-hmm. then the plastic surgeon is a big part of the surgery. But they talk together weekly and they communicate hand in hand the progress of everything and getting ready for surgery. Yeah, I don't know why. I mean, I've seen like Thanks. people comment, um, no, then the NAM isn't necessary and stuff like that. Or they say, you know, it only helps a surgeon. And I don't know. My first thought with things like that is like, why wouldn't you want to help the surgeon? I don't understand. I don't understand like why that's the rebuttal for it. Like it's just an yeah. odd thing to me. <laughs> it's like I've never heard that before. Yeah. I would say it's like exactly like a palate expander for your mouth, yeah. except it's a palate you're bringing it together. And if you're slowly doing that, then the whole point. So right now they're receiving all the studies over the past 20 years there's finally patients that have lived the life of the nam and Mm -hmm. they say that those the revisions are a lot less for children Mm -hmm. who had that opportunity than when you're trying to pull your pieces of skin and your palate together when they're further apart you have sometimes nose collapses and and things like mm-hmm. that and that there's just different things that happen because yeah the, it, it didn't pull it together enough and if you can do that and have less surgeries later i think that's it's a beautiful thing and so now they're seeing all those studies come out with the results over the past 20 years and i think it's great but mm-hmm. it's a decision for each family it's homework it's a hard, you have to be dedicated to it yeah, and you have to be involved every day in it. So, yeah, it can be tough. I understand. I didn't experience it that at all, but just in thinking about it, I know it just sounds like something that's really challenging. And then also just seeing your child just be uncomfortable, as you said, like anesthesia was ripping it out. I would be by the, if I had to wear this thing for a couple of months, that's not something that we want to see any of our children have to go to, but it's in their best interest. And so I feel like I've only heard like really good things about the results and we will, I'm going to have an expert on the name come on to 
to talk about it, an actual medical professional to t- to talk about that that process just because I don't un- like I don't you're actually the first person that I've been able to talk to about it. And since it wasn't a part of our journey, it's the first time that I've been able to like really understand it a little bit better. Thank yeah. you for providing context for that. And so after her surgery, what was that initial reaction the first time seeing her? I know it varies so much from mom to mom. What was that? What was your reaction and and seeing her for the first time? Oh, that weird. It was just, it was, I don't even think I was really thinking results yet because I was just thinking of how much pain she must be in, Mm. how swollen her entire face was. Because she was just so swollen. She couldn't wait. She wasn't awake. Mm. We stayed overnight. And she, I just, it was hard. We, they, the nurse early on talked about how cleft baby smiles are the best because they're so wide and big. And I was like, whatever. But I really <laughs> did fall in love with her. Yeah, I really did fall in love with her smile it was so big and I just totally got it when finally around three and four months she's just completely all smiles and I made sure we did some kind of photo shoot of course oh, before yeah. and to document it and make sure that she sees it like she'll know that she had and still has she was born beautiful and but when I when she came out of the surgery I was just in mom mode when just in fight or flight and making sure she was comfortable and making sure she could get to the next step where she could eat. And when yeah. she finally could get that bottle in her mouth, <laughs> it was game on. Talk about a comeback for gaining weight and sucking down a bottle. I like her eyes lit up. Like I just can't even, I can just, I can be in that moment again and know that she was like, oh my God, Bobby, I don't have to sit here for 45 (laughs) minutes and just clamp down on this stupid bottle and wait for it to spray in my mouth. I'm like sucking on a bottle. I was like, yeah, baby, you got it. God, I can't even imagine that moment. Like that is so (laughs) cool. It's like, yeah. uh, Wow. What a special moment. Yeah. Yeah. It was like within two days, I think she was just like more like, okay. You can have whatever you want. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Oh, my goodness. The same. Uh, I would have had the same reaction. Whatever. What? Literally, whatever you want. It's just drink. (laughs) Oh, goodness. You provided so much, like, great information here. I feel like we could talk on and on. But I, we do have a Clef Mom question of the week that I wanted to ask you. So the Clef Mom question of the week is, I just found out that my son is going to be born with a cleft lip and possible cleft palate. The doctors have made a referral to the cleft team. What questions should I ask? How do I know if this is the best team for our family? I'm terrified. <laughs> oh, mommy, I know. <laughs> and that's okay. Like. Just take a deep breath, put your brain in charge, and take your time. Just take your time to research the program and and get a second program to talk with in line with it. It's always good to shop around. <laughs> no, yeah. it's good to keep it keep the programs honest. Hey, this program I I would reference it. They did this, whatever. What are they doing before birth? Are you mm-hmm. able to meet the team? Are you, what kind of tests are they doing? Are they looking for, are they going to do a uh, EKG on the heart? Are they going to do, are they going to check the brain and then MRI like on the brain? Are they doing, what kind of steps do they do prior? Can you meet the surgeon? Can you meet the orthodontist? Are they in the same building? Do they have weekly mm-hmm. meetings? And then... So right after birth, how does the one hospital talk to the team? Who's reporting to who? Are they in the same network? Do they talk with the same portals? Uh, and then I'm just rattling, like all these things are firing in my head. But yeah, soon yeah. after, how soon after they give birth are you going to the team? Um, yeah. What 
kind of are you getting set up with bottle kits prior to birth? The pigeon bottles, the Dr. Brown bottles with the filters, the any other cleft palate, cleft bottles that they're able to give you ahead of time. Um, who do you call in the middle of the night if, if it's before you meet the team to get guidance on how to feed the baby? Can I see some? I would get the earlier, the better. The earlier that you can talk to a feeding specialist from the cleft lip and palate team, the better. Yeah. And then you're keeping notes on your phone because postpartum is the craziest thing. You you don't remember anything. <laughs> and so, as, as you've you're heard like, throughout what? this episode. <laughs> oh my goodness. Keep a notes page on your phone and anybody you talk to, you get your their name, you get their reference. And it's not to be, it's just to know, have knowledge and know that you can reference certain things, times, dates. You have to be a good note taker. And if your husband needs something to do or your partner needs something to do or your mom or whoever your support person is, give them that task. Whenever mm-hmm. somebody walks in the room, you have them take notes. That's going to be the biggest uh, gift that they can give you is helping with those situations too. Yeah. yeah, I guess I could sit those... fire for a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, those are all like really great questions. I think if you're able to like slow down this point of the podcast and just write all of those down, like they're like even just in asking who can I contact in the middle of the night if I have a question, I feel like sometimes after your baby is born and you're just, you know, think things happen, right? And you're scared and you want you know, a professional to be able to answer questions for you on the fly or just to at least be available to to give you a call back just to give you some reassurance or to get an appointment or something like that the next day. Just like the small things like that are things that you should prepare for early on. And um, yeah, I just, I think that those are all like really great questions that you should be asking the other thing is that sometimes i feel like we just people in general we're intimidated like by medical personnel we feel just the act of of taking notes right during uh, an appointment seems almost like you you i know i would feel like i was i would be challenging them but this is i just want to reiterate and to strengthen you in knowing this is your child you're your child's biggest advocate and who cares if the people that are that you're trusting to care for your child feels intimidated by you taking notes or asking questions you have the right to do that who else is going to do that for your child you you should and and so yeah I think that's really great advice because you do forget a lot of things getting a lot like you know just being in the shuffle of everything and um just trying to get your child the best care but yeah take notes so that you can remember um and don't feel you know in- intimidated or, or bad about wanting to do that uh, for your child so yeah so just um i think that jennifer summed up a lot of great questions there so we'll i won't add anything additional to that but what do you think is the best advice that you've received as a mother So I think I'm just going to reference a little thing that I wrote, sharing a little bit about the journey. We talked to the whole team, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, and this was my biggest takeaway. And I wrote this little, little journal entry about it. As we concluded our meeting and the doctor approved me as a healthy mom to give birth at one of the top children's hospitals in the world. The doctor looked directly in my eyes and said, Jennifer, there's one more thing I need you to do. She said, repeat after me. I did not do this to my child. And after such a successful day and a warm blanket of comfort and even confidence swept over my fears and unknowns, I felt a huge lump in my throat and my eyes full to the brim with tears. So I did what I try to always do when deflecting those emotions in front of others. I smiled, but I could not get those words out. Jennifer, I need to hear you say this before we leave the meeting. I did not do this to my child. How did she know? How did she know the hardest, that the hardest part of this entire process was the guilt I was carrying? All the questions rushed in my head on a teleprompter flashing red, as if I was solving a case or scientific mystery. 
Did I eat the right food? Did I exercise enough? Did I take vitamins? Was I exposed to any chemicals? Did I gain too much weight in the, my first pregnancy? Was my body too stressed? And the anger part of the grieving process led me to the it's not fair questions. I didn't do drugs. I barely had a glass of wine between the babies because of breastfeeding. I was a Division One athlete and continued to be ath- active and healthy my entire life. I used essential oils, paraben-free, organic, PBA-free, anything. And yet my baby would be born with physical birth defect that can lead to an onset of other issues, and I couldn't even begin to explain it. It just wasn't fair. But repeating those words was honestly the thing that could have happened was the best thing that could have happened to Cody and me in this journey. And with my quivering voice and with my tears washing my face, gripping Cody's hand so hard and snot rolling down my nose under my mask, I said, I did not do this to my child. And the doctor turned to Cody and said, I need dad to say this too. And I proudly watched him repeat the words and our hands loosened our tight grip and release and relief rolled off our shoulders. So just in listening to the best advice, um, I think that Jennifer would give this same advice to you all that are listening. And if you want to repeat um, those words to yourself today, I did not do this to my child. We want to give you the space to do that now. So please just continue to be kind to yourselves and just repeat that mantra to yourselves throughout your journey just to feel that release and that acknowledgement and knowing that you did everything that you could and you did everything right and that you're the best advocate and the best supporter for your child and that you will get through this. Um, So yeah. I just want to thank you, Jennifer, first and foremost, for sharing your story here with us today. And thank you all for listening to the Our Forever Smiles Cuff Mom Diaries and Support Podcast. Be sure to subscribe and submit a review of the podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. I hope that you have enjoyed this audio experience. Maybe you cried a little, laughed a little, but more importantly, I hope that you feel a little piece of reassurance and even joy in your journey. Talk to you next week.